Uh, September 1st, uh, 2021, before the Supreme Court's infamous June ruling overturning abortion as a constitutional right, a dastardly bill known as Senate Bill 8 took effect in the state of Texas. This bill was a harbinger of things to come. It was the first six-week abortion ban to be tied to a civil bounty law whereby anyone, even strangers, could sue someone who performed an, or even indirectly facilitated an abortion after six weeks with a minimum of $10,000 in penalties per abortion. As you know, this law, which immediately halted most abortions here in the state of Texas, was quickly challenged. In a chilling action that foretold the Dobbs ruling, the extremist supermajority on the Supreme Court declined to help. And eventually, that appeal was dead. It was during the High Court's oral arguments in this case that Justice Sonia Sotomayor famously asked, will this institution survive the stench that this creates in the public perception that the Constitution and its reading are just political acts? I think we can say no to that question. Well, we have here today the principal plaintiff in that legal challenge against SB 8. In fact, this individual has been a fierce defender of abortion rights for years, including in the courts. She brought the successful case, Whole Woman's Health versus Hellerstadt, in which the Supreme Court in its previous iteration back in 2016 ruled in her favor. The court that year issued a 5-3 decision that Texas couldn't restrict delivery of abortion care through trap laws that place an undue burden on the woman. This plaintiff is today's 2022 Forward Award honoree, Amy Hagstrom Miller. Ms. Hagstrom Miller founded Whole Woman's Health in, 20, in 2003, and it's a series of clinics that provide abortion and gynecological care in many parts of the nation and uh, including Texas. Hagstrom Miller, uh, Ms. Hagstrom Miller also founded the nonprofit Whole Woman's Health Alliance in 2014, which works to remove the stigma around providing quality abortion care. Very heavy. Um, <laughs> it's, it's a full bronze uh, statue, and it was fashioned for us, those of you who've been at <laughs> Previous conventions may be remembered by our member and a renowned sculptor, Zenos Fridakis, and it's a modern recast of the classical archetypal statues of liberty as embodied by a woman, and it's reserved for individuals who are moving society forward. And to acknowledge her steadfast commitment to moving society forward to reproductive rights and access uh, on behalf of the Freedom from Religion Foundation, I'm honored to give this award to Amy Hagstrom Miller. And I do, where, is she here? Yes, I do warn you, it is heavy, but I would like to hand it to you. Thank y'all. Boo, can you hear me okay? Awesome, I brought like notes because I'm gonna take you to abortion school, you ready? Okay, good, good, I figured you would be. Um, tech, yay, look at that, it happened without me asking. Uh, so initially, I decided to call um, my words for you never back down. I will tell you that this year, has been quite a gut punch. Um, normally, we are at Whole Woman's Health and Whole Woman's Health Alliance, we're described as resilient, as brave, as heroic. Um, this year has had a lot of trauma. It's had a lot of tragedy. Uh, it's had a lot of grief and despair. And from those combined complex emotions, I come to you today. It is the first time I have come to Texas since Roe fell. I no longer live here, and so I wasn't sure how it would feel to be here. Um, but I was reminded last night walking along the Riverwalk um, that these um, kinds of laws don't represent the majority of Texans. 
the majority of people in this country don't support the kinds of laws that have taken place in this country. And um, that I'm emboldened by how um, the majority of people in this country live and believe and support access to safe abortion and um, just getting them to vote and speak up and participate. Um, hopefully, we can change the powers that be. So with that, I will take you to Texas. What I would call um, the good stuff in reproductive rights comes from Texas. Keep in mind, Roe v. Wade came from Texas. And Whole Woman's Health v. Hellerstead came from Texas. And Whole Woman's Health v. Hellerstead um, was seen as the um, reproductive rights case for a generation. We were able to um, preserve the undue burden standard. Um, we were able to use, drum roll, science um, to roll back people's feelings and beliefs and really illustrate that restrictions on abortion do not advance women's health and safety, but in fact they damage families, they damage communities, uh, and Basically, we, we sort of um, slapped down the powers that be in the state of Texas, and um, I believe um, one of the justices in the majority decision said, um, Texas uh, anti-abortion politicians can't insert themselves willy-nilly between a woman and her right to seek an abortion without supporting those restrictions by medical evidence and scientific fact. That's huge. It was huge. Um, we sort of missed our opportunity for swagger because um, a certain someone was elected a few months later and there's been sort of a downslide ever since um, when it comes to reproductive rights in this country. Um, the bad stuff that's come from Texas, I don't need to read it aloud, y'all can read, it's all listed on the slide. Um, an enormous amount of abortion regulations come from Texas and it is true that what happens here does not stay here. Texas is considered a... a uh, starting ground for a lot of anti-abortion regulations, 24-hour uh, waiting period, forced ultrasound, state-mandated information, uh, information we have to give patients that um, connects abortion to breast cancer, all this nonsense, all of it had its root here in Texas, and you've seen it spread across the country. <clears throat> I'm going to take you on a journey of a few years' time to set the tone, and I'm going to start here with 2013 just so that you have a sense of what was, what was before HB2 even happened, which was the case called Whole Woman's Health v. Hellerstead that we eventually won. Before that, we had all of these restrictions, some of the ones I described already. We also had a two-visit requirement, mandatory at least 24-hour delay. Patients had to be seen in two different visits, sometimes usually three or four different visits before they could complete their abortion. Um, abortion facilities were highly regulated such that there was hardly any facilities left with the amount of regulation that went into play. And on top of that, we were introducing additional restrictions with HB2 in 2013 that required ambulatory surgical center facilities, required admitting privileges for physicians, banned abortion at 20 weeks, et cetera. That was a sort of um, precursor to what happened last year with SBH. So, um, HB2 in 2013 served to shutter all but five clinics in the state of Texas. Prior to HB2, there were 44. Prior to that, a year before that, there were 60. Um, and keep in mind that you can fit seven Virginias in the state of Texas. Um, Texas has four of the top 10 state cities as far as population in this country. So what we're talking about is 10% of this country's population of reproductive age lives here in Texas. It is not a small fraction of people. So that's the sort of groundwork that, that went into our challenging HB2. We were able to make the argument that it was an undue burden for millions of people um, and that it um, unduly affected lots of people who lived in parts of, the parts of the state that were well over 150 miles each way to be able to get care. So it took three years. Lawyers say that's fast. Um, if you're answering the phone from people who are seeking abortion care, it felt like an eternity. Uh, that we were not able to see people until we finally um, were able to get justice in the Supreme Court in 2016. As soon as we knocked down the sort of notion that anti-abortion people had women's health and safety in mind, like I described before, and we illustrated that in fact uh, restrictions on abortion roll health and safety backwards, and we put forward science, medical evidence, et cetera, um, as soon as we won the whole women's health case, you see the anti-abortion movement take a pivot away from a concern about the pregnant person and a focus on the fetus. And you've seen this since 2016 with all the kinds of restrictions and regulations that have, have been introduced since 2016. Within five days of us winning, Whole Woman's Health v. Heller said, Texas introduced a law that required every uh, fetus or products of conception to have a funeral or cremation. 
which we had to start a lawsuit literally about five days after we won the one, we had to become plaintiffs once again. Uh, they restricted gestation, they tried this heartbeat stuff, um, and you see a trend nationally with um, gestational bans, whether it's a 20-week ban, a 15-week ban, a six-week ban, what they're doing is focusing on the fetus, and, and in fact, they have started to call um, the pregnant person a host. <laughs> Oftentimes, when you listen to um, the, the sort of legislative interactions around bills like this, um, that's, that's some of the stuff that you hear. So the landscape has been forever changed in this country um, by the appointees that the former president was able to make. Um, we have some remarkable zealots on the Supreme Court at this point, and it's not only the Supreme Court that the, that the Trump administration changed, um, changed forever the, the appeals courts and the federal court system in this country. <clears throat> so one of the first signs of this was when the Governor Abbott here in Texas used the COVID-19 pandemic in order to restrict abortion. He used the pandemic as, as an excuse to ban abortion. He tried to say that abortion was not essential medical care. Keep in mind, abortion is extremely timely. Um, and when people lose their jobs and they lose their health care, their need for abortion skyrockets. Um, and so during the pandemic, he used the pandemic as a way to ban abortion, saying that uh, abortion providers used a disproportionate amount of PPE, and we were somehow stealing PPE from the hospitals. Uh, it was an interesting time. Um, Whole Woman's Health figured out how to do medication abortion without using any PPE at all. And we stayed open and resisted uh, that ban. But the chilling effect of Governor Abbott and um, our Attorney General, et cetera, kind of coming after abortion providers was, was pretty profound at that time. So we found ourselves suing again. And this time, um, we did get an injunction and were able to illustrate that the executive order was not in the best uh, interests of people's health and safety. And it was about three weeks' time, back and forth and back and forth, uh, where hundreds of patients' appointments were canceled, and then we called them and rescheduled them. And keep in mind, during a pandemic, people were literally begging us. Um, it was horrific to see the dignity um, and the respect that was lost from people in our country who deserved access to health care during a pandemic, especially um, access to safe abortion care. In total, 13 other states took the example from Texas and attempted to restrict abortion access during that time. Um, and this was April of 2021. Then we get another version of uh, an attack on abortion. And in March of 2021, the legislature introduced a six-week ban on abortion. The anti-abortion folks call this a heartbeat ban. Um, science will tell you there is not a heartbeat. There can't be a heartbeat before there's a fetus. Um, but this was language. They're very good at language. They're very good at messaging and introduced that restriction in the state of Texas. And this law um, was the most restrictive abortion ban that this country has seen um, at that point in time. Uh, the other part of the, the SB, um, SB8 that was terrifying is that it's what they call, quote unquote, vigilante justice that it incentivized people to report anybody who might um, not only provide an abortion, but do what's called aiding and abetting uh, in the assistance of abortion. So somebody who gives somebody a ride, somebody who lends somebody money. Um, it was attempted and successfully terrified everybody in all different stratas of the society. Um, people were afraid of helping folks um, get to the abortion care that they deserved and that they needed. Uh, we haven't seen a law like this since the Fugitive Slave Act where people were incentivized to hunt other people down. Um, and it, people at that time, um, I remember people at that time called it um, Texas Taliban. I saw a lot of people posting about on, on Twitter and on um, social media. And I remember saying, this is, not, this, first of all, that's pretty racist. Second of all, this isn't the Taliban. This is homegrown United States Christian extremism. <clears throat> And we need to take responsibility. This has happened on our watch in our country, right? That these extremists have been able to pass laws like this. Um, so we fought until the last minute um, on July, that should be 31st, not 13th. The, um, the night before that law went into effect, um, oh yeah, August 31st, sorry. The night before the law went into effect, our Fort Worth clinic was, our parking lot was packed 
with patients. People were very aware that this might be the last day in the state of Texas that they could get access to safe abortion. We decided to try to care for as many people as we could, and we stayed open until midnight. Um, and the anti-abortion people went crazy. They all came and surrounded the clinic. They brought these big lights, not unlike the ones that are shining in my face right now, and they shined them at the clinic under surveillance to try to watch us to be sure that they could catch us if the staff um, indeed provided any care after midnight. It was an incredible sort of standoff um, that happened at that moment, and some of those patients that were in the clinic were very aware that they were receiving care that their friends and their sisters and their, their colleagues might not be able to receive even just um, on the next day in the state of Texas. Um, we tried to ban, we tried to um, get an injunction to block SB8 from going into effect. And here again, as we've experienced in Texas, it was this back and forth, right? We get an injunction um, in Austin in federal court, it gets overturned by the Fifth Circuit, then we have to appeal to the Supreme Court to step in and it bounces back and forth. Um, all the while, the people that we are caring for, the people who are calling us on the phone asking for care, um, they're not watching the news, they're not seeing this back and forth ping pong. What, what they need is access to safe abortion care. Um, more than 70% of the people we serve in the state of Texas are parenting already when they seek abortion. Um, they know exactly what that ultrasound looks like and they know exactly what will happen if they continue that pregnancy because they're already negotiating a family, multiple jobs, keep in mind, in the middle of a pandemic, right? So. The Supreme Court, as, the, as, as we've talked about earlier, um, refused to grant us an injunction um, for relief from SB 8, allowing the law to, to stay in place. And this led to the scathing uh, dissent, which I highly recommend you read from Justice Sotomayor. Um, sometimes we call her um, the new RBG. Thank goodness. Um, and she said, in addition to what um, my predecessor here at the mic read, she said the court should not be so content as to ignore its constitutional obligation to protect not only the rights of women, but also the sanctity of precedent um, and the rule of law, I dissent. And her dissent goes on quite a bit from there. Um, so soon after that, um, after we got uh, we got denied the injunction. It's hard to, this is all like, keep in mind, I'm just months into one year. Like, this is just like a few months into 2020, 2021 after we got this, uh, it, after we got this law passed. Um, Vice President Harris invited me and some other providers to the White House. It was the first time an abortion provider had been invited to the White House since 1992, since Clinton was, in, was, was there. And um, on the day that we were there, the Department of Justice announced its case against Texas. Um, it was pretty cool to be in the White House when they announced a case called the United States versus Texas. Um, it was a pretty good day. And uh, the White House started to say abortion. Not really, um, I, haven't, I hadn't heard it from President Biden until Roe fell, until the Dobbs decision was leaked, but uh, Vice President Harris um, said that in that little room that I was in. And I want to point out why that's important, um, because a lot of the people who have abortions in this country find themselves sort of invisible in our public rhetoric. When people talk about abortion as a choice, uh, when people talk about it as a reproductive decision, our patients don't call us and say, I'd like to make an appointment for a reproductive decision. Uh, our, our patients don't call us and say, I'd like to exercise my civil right to have an abortion. Uh, people don't experience this care in the framework that we oftentimes use as progressive people in, in our culture. And it's very important that um, the millions of people who've had abortions in this country and the millions of people who have been part of that abortion, whether they were the man who got the person pregnant or whether they're a loved one of that person, see their experience reflected in the way we talk, right? So it's very important to, to start to hear the people that we elected on a platform um, use the language that's really necessary at this time. It's what the first time, one of the first times I heard um, Vice President Harris say that word. Um, we got an injunction, it felt like it lasted about a minute and a half, um, from, Justice, from, from Judge Pittman. Um, and by this time, there was so much uncertainty uh, in the state of Texas. There was delays, there was chaos, there were begging patients, there was back and forth and back and forth with if the law was in effect or the law wasn't in effect. Um, there was a ton of what I would think of as sort of increased attention and power given to this notion of aiding and abetting. It got way more power than it actually should on the, on the legal books. And what happened in the state of Texas is that anti-abortion forces got total compliance 
from every provider and every helper in the state without ever actually suing anyone. And I don't know how many of you have read Foucault and other like social scientists, but pre-compliance or over-compliance is one of the first signs of authoritarianism. And it's, it's understandable because they were bounty hunting physicians. These are people who were being told that they would go to jail and be fined. And these are folks who are supporting their own families. But what happened is this terror and this fear of doing the work that we love and helping the people that we are highly trained to help because of the fear of these bounty hunters and this vigilante justice system. Um, so hardly anybody provided abortions when we had this little injunction because the other thing about SB8 is that it provided for retroactive lawsuits. If an injunction was lifted and you provided any care during that injunctive period, SB8 had a provision that allows people to go back and sue you after the fact. Um, it's amazing that this law got passed. Um, and so of course, um, very few people, I think maybe there was 10 procedures provided during that really short injunction period. And then uh, once again, the Fifth Circuit um, reversed the injunction. And SB8 has been um, enforced ever since. So right during this time period, um, we ended up challenging that reversal of the injunction and bringing it back to the Supreme Court. Um, and the Supreme Court chose not to step in. And we had to get a hearing at the Supreme Court. And I never thought I'd end up at the Supreme Court again so fast. Um, but there we were with our own case, Whole Woman's Health v. Jackson, in front of the Supreme Court on November 1st of 2021, trying to knock down SB8. And one month later, um, the court heard the Dobbs case from Mississippi on December 1st of 2021. Keep in mind that the Mississippi case was originally just about a 15-week ban. And then once the Supreme Court makeup changed from President Trump's nominations and the, the swearing in of the new justices, the Mississippi added um, Roe to that case and asked the court to look into um, the argument that Roe was, was argued on and, and appeal for a reverse of Roe. They added that to a 15-week case once the, court, the makeup of the court changed. Um, so if any of you listened to the arguments in the Dobbs case, um, we knew we were in trouble just from listening to the oral arguments. Um, it, was, it was a completely different court than the court my whole women's health case had been in front of just five years before. Um, this is the arguments where um, Amy Coney Barrett suggests that women just drop babies off at fire stations as a solution to uh, unplanned pregnancy. I mean, it was just like I was gobsmacked listening to the kinds of things that the new justices were suggesting. Um, so U.S. v. Texas and Whole Woman's Health v. Jackson were both dismissed. Um, shortly after the Dobbs case was heard, so we didn't get justice in either of those cases. And then um, here comes May, right? Unprecedented, never happened in the history of this entire country. But the draft decision, which one could just hope that they might have edited a little bit before the final decision, um, but they didn't. Um, the draft decision was leaked in the Dobbs case. Um, and it is shocking, if any of you have read it. Um, and it was very obviously a draft where Justice Alito, the, the lead writer on the draft, was in, very interested in overturning Roe. And um, the country went into a tailspin. Um, folks were no longer like, what if, what if, what if? It was like, when? You know, when is this decision going to come down? And how are we going to prepare for it? Um, I have never spent so much time in the last, as I have in the last year and a half staring at the map of the United States. Um, I can tell you every single rule in every single state, um, which, which states are haven states, which states are banned states, um, you know, which interstate goes from one um, part of the country to another part of the country, which airports have the best in, you know, access, which airlines have nonstop flights, which ones are cheaper, which ones get canceled less often. Um, it's amazing the amount of work that myself and other providers and abortion funds have gone through in this last year to try to figure out how do we prepare for what's about to come. Uh, so here we are now. This is actually uh, Whole Woman's Health of McAllen 
which is the only clinic that was south of San Antonio um, at, from 2013 on, because the previous laws got rid of all the other clinics, and we were the last clinic standing south of San Antonio. Uh, we served people for the radius of about 250 to 300 miles, was the next closest clinic. And uh, we had to stop providing abortions on June 24th when Dobbs came down. Uh, we have since closed the clinic, and um, that's the mural that we, we had. Um, I had a muralist, a local muralist paint on the outside of the clinic. Um, I did that because anti-abortion people stand outside right on that sidewalk and hold these terrible signs, and I wanted something beautiful behind them so that they look terrible. Um, <laughs> and uh, this clinic is on Main Street across from City Hall, and there's this, this building has had an abortion provider in it since Roe. Um, and that's Whole Woman's Health of McAllen. Here we are. Uh, we had to close all of the t clinics operated by Whole Woman's Health in Texas. So that was Austin and Fort Worth and McKinney and McAllen. Um, these are some images of our clinics being boxed up. Um, every single abortion um, provider ceased operations uh, when Roe fell in the state of Texas, including um, about 10 other states that also had what are called trigger bans, which are abortion bans that existed with the provision that if Roe fell at the federal level, um, abortion would be banned instantly in that state. Uh, and Texas uh, was one of them. Texas passed the trigger ban um, a couple years ago. So really an end of an era for us. Uh, and I want to take you now into the present. Um, keep in mind, Texas, uh, Whole Woman's Health sued Texas no less than 11 times um, during the time that we were open. And, um, you know, I think We'll see what happens in the, in the long-term future, but I think one of the most challenging things for people right now is that there isn't this sort of narrative arc of redemption that I think we've gotten used to in the reproductive rights movement, where they pass a bad law, you can prove it's crazy, you can get an injunction or a temporary restraining order, or you can sue or you can eventually get justice. Like, that narrative arc is no longer here, right? And so either we rely on the executive branch or we rely on the legislative branch but we're not going to hold our breath for justice, at least on the federal level from the court system. There are some states where, like, the state Supreme Court might be able to get justice or a state ballot initiative, hello, Kansas, might be able to give people some justice. Uh, but that's what we're dealing with. We're dealing with a state-by-state -state, um, kind of interaction right now. And keep in mind that the majority of people seek abortions because they don't feel like ready to parent. They don't feel ready to have another child. It's oftentimes an economic issue. Um, so anytime you see somebody discussing the upcoming election and separating economics and abortion, please write an op-ed. Please give them some feedback because the, you can't separate those issues in the eyes of people who are parenting and, and um, navigating these issues. Um, so the states that are the bluest of the blue here are considered safe haven states, which means that abortion, uh, access to safe abortion is either codified at the state level, protected in some way at the state level. The light blue ones are... Um, well, we've rolled back every single restriction on abortion in the state of Virginia, where I live now, except then we elected Yunkin, right? And so people feel like, ooh, don't make that state completely blue. What's going to happen there? Um, it's not considered a safe haven. Roe isn't codified at the state level. But there are no restrictions on abortion at this point in time in Virginia. And so some of those states were looking at elections, like Pennsylvania. Um, we're looking at elections in Ohio, in North Carolina, in Arizona. We're kind of concerned about what might happen at the state level. But the, the states that are dark blue are states that have preserved access to safe abortion at the state level. Whole Woman's Health, we had to close the four Texas clinics, like I mentioned. Um, we sued to block the injunction in Indiana. And we got an injunction, I mean, to block the ban in Indiana, and we got an injunction, uh, which surprised all of us. We were like, holy macro, we didn't expect that. So that's been, that's been awesome, because we've been able to stay open in our clinic in South Bend. Um, yes, we have a clinic in South Bend, Indiana, right under the shadow of Notre Dame. Um, there's a lot of folks who need our help there. Um, and uh, we're stable for now in Virginia and in Minnesota and Maryland. Um, we've also launched a virtual abortion care program um, that I'll tell you a little bit about. So this is what our country looks like right now. Every place red has banned abortion since Roe fell. Y'all, that's like three, four months ago. Um, the states in green have either banned, they've added some kind of restriction. Uh, Florida added a um, 
15-week ban, Georgia added a six-week ban, Ohio has a six-week ban, it goes back and forth, Indiana is going back and forth, but what I want you to see is that red, right? So we're talking hundreds of miles that somebody from Texas or Louisiana or Mississippi has to travel to either reach New Mexico or Kansas or Illinois. And the vast majority of people can't take multiple days off work, travel out of the state, um, arrange for childcare, et cetera. And so many people are being forced to carry pregnancies uh, to term against their will that they don't feel ready for emotionally, financially. Uh, some people are taking matters into their own hands, self-managing their own abortions, and other folks are able to figure out how to travel. We have four clinics that we call Surge Ready. So we are in, Whole Woman's Health has four different sites in states that are haven states where abortion is protected. We are seeing people coming from all over the country. Um, and we are um, doing lots of things to help ease that, right? Figure out how to help people travel, figure out how to help people, um, you know, cultural differences, language differences, people coming from different parts of the country, people traveling into one state with license plates from a different state who might either be um, profiled or surveilled or followed, especially going from Texas to New Mexico. Uh, and so there's a lot of wraparound things that um, those of us human rights workers that work in abortion have sort of added to our work at this point in this country. Um, we launched abortion pills by mail thanks to the Biden administration for you, um, opening up the FDA's restrictions on medication abortion and allowing medication abortion to be mailed during the pandemic um, because it's much safer. Uh, medication abortion is safer than Tylenol, um, but it's also um, much more accessible this way so that folks don't have to go into clinics during a pandemic. Um, and we do a telemedicine visit for a patient and then we're able to ship medications to them at an address in a state where abortion is legal and telemedicine is allowed. Uh, we've launched this in five states so far, um, but telemedicine for abortion care is available in 22 states in this country. Um, unfortunately, none of them are the red states you saw in the last map, of course, because those states also restrict abortion. But folks can travel into New Mexico for example, from Texas, if they're Texans and they can do their telemedicine visit in New Mexico and receive the medication at an address in New Mexico. So it's helped some. Um, and we've launched a program called the Wayfinder Program, which is literally we help people find their way uh, from a place where abortion is banned to a place where it's still accessible. Uh, we started our Wayfinder Program through our nonprofit, a Whole Woman's Health Alliance, um, back a few slides ago when I told you about the executive order from Governor Abbott, right? So that's when it started because people were being denied abortion care and we had to figure out how to help them travel with our abortion fund, either with travel support or support to pay for the abortion. And then of course our program grew exponentially during SB8 where um, you know, no less than 80% of Texans um, normally have abortions over six weeks, and so so many people were being denied access to care, we had to help them travel. And here again now, the program has really become national um, because of all the states that you saw um, where abortion has been banned. So, here we are. I think it's important for us all to remember that abortion is a moral and social good. That abortion access to safe abortion improves communities. It improves mental health, it improves physical health, it improves economic health. Um, the data to support that since Roe is exponential. I mean, just talk to any economist, talk to any, um, anybody who studies the statistics about how much access to safe abortion has improved our society writ large. Um, I think it's important for us to look at abortion as a human rights issue, not only as a woman's rights issue. Millions of men have benefited from access to safe abortion in this country. And I think it's time for all of us to really embrace that this is a human rights issue and that access to safe abortion affects us because we all know somebody or love somebody who's either had an abortion or might need an abortion at some time in their lives. There's a new frontier for anti-abortion forces. Um, we're starting to see them cross borders. Um, we're starting to see them try to foment uh, anti-abortion activity in the sort of red communities in blue states, right? So like more conservative communities in Virginia or New Mexico or Southern Illinois trying to get um, sanctuary city bans or local city councils to try to ban abortion care. So pay attention to that. 
um, because that's a new wave of some of their activity that I think is important for us to watch. So, you've done a good job as abor at abortion school, y'all. Um, my asks of you would be to follow us on social media, um, Whole Woman's Health and Whole Woman's Health Alliance, because we can give you lots of information about what to do. Uh, if you sign up uh, to our newsletter, we'll share kind of some of the stuff that I've shared here, like what's happening in the country, what's happening in this state, why are we watching this state Supreme Court election, why does this um, House seat matter so much, et cetera. Because a lot of the work right now is at a state-by-state -state level um, until we can sort of fix the, the, the federal level. Um, and I would say you could donate, um, not only to Whole Woman's Health Alliance, our nonprofit, but I have a GoFundMe that is funding our move of our Texas clinics to New Mexico. And um, if you're interested in supporting that, that would be awesome as well. I did bring a couple annual reports. If you're one of those kind of people that likes to look at that kind of stuff, it's at a literature table in the back. Um, and I would ask you to speak about the positive aspects of abortion in your life and in people that you've known. Um, use the aspirational narrative. Because of abortion, I have been able to do X. Because of abortion, somebody I know or love was able to do X. I think it's important for us to shift that rhetoric to the positive value of abortion instead of look at it through the framework that the opposition looks at through the stigma and through the shame. So with that, who knows if I took more time or less time than I was supposed to, but um, I'm happy to take questions. <laughs> Sure. You, I think you can pull rank. Probably. I'm going to ask the first question. I'm wondering what you yeah. think about court reform and court expansion at the federal level. Um, here again, it's a little bit of a longer arc, right? Um, I think court reform is very important. Um, I think that the justices that got confirmed uh, during the Trump administration, I think there was a lot of cheating that happened, um, and so I, I don't see it as justice, and so I do think court reform is really important. I, I worry that it w has a lot of opposition and that it takes a lot of time. You know, it's, it, it, I think it would be challenging for us to get justice in the short run, um, but I do think it's important for us to, to talk about that and to work toward it. I'm, I'm, I'm decidedly pro-choice, so I frequently get into discussions mm -hmm. with others of a different persuasion, and the conversation often gets wrapped up around what is the prognosis for a child which is born, which was not wanted. Are they all immediately picked up by millionaires who are gonna deliver them to paradise in our time? <laughs> or do they just stay as unwanted infants until they're 21 or something? Mm -hmm. There's no statistics. I've looked hard on the web. There's nothing decipherable I could find there. Hmm. Um, I think uh, there's a lot I could say about that, but I think what we have to remember is that the pregnant person has rights, and the pregnant person's rights, and if they want to continue a pregnancy, and if they feel able to continue a pregnancy and, get, and deliver, um, being pregnant is a real thing. You know, it's not just like, oh, I'm just gonna, you know, the way that Amy Coney Barrett talked about dropping your child off at a fire station, it made it sound like a handbag or something, you know? And I think we have to remember that it's ultimately up to the pregnant person to decide what happens. And that um, the majority of, um, I think it's hard to study foster care systems and the breakdown of society when you have a lot of um, pregnancies that are that are continued and, and births that happen with people that don't feel ready for it. I think we're going to see what happens in the state of Texas. Um, we have seen maternal mortality skyrocket in the state of Texas when abortion clinics closed and when restrictions were made on family planning. Um, Texas and Mississippi are in a race to the bottom for maternal mortality, especially under black, for black and brown women. It's directly related to access to safe abortion. And these are groups that aren't often studied. These are, these are babies that aren't often taken care of in foster care or adoption. And so I think you've got to have a longer answer when you talk about it. And you also can't talk about um, a child in the abstract, right? Like you have to talk about the real lives of people who make those decisions and what rights they have to make them. So I think always go back to the pregnant person and their autonomy and their equality and their ability to make decisions. Um, irrespective of, of the pregnancy. Hi. 
all the way in the back here. Um, I respectfully I request a correction to your training. Uh, the people of the state of Michigan collected 750,000 signatures mm -hmm. to place a constitutional amendment on our Michigan Constitution next Tuesday, November 8th. Yep. And we are, and we're polling, we're gonna win. And which is wonderful. So Roe v. Wade will actually be in the Constitution of the state of Michigan, so it can't be messed with by legislature. We're uh, also, I'd like to point out that one of the biggest problems we're running into in Michigan is 80% of the hospital beds in the state of Michigan are owned by the Catholic Church. Yep. Absolutely, positively, no reproductive health, no, uh, no vasectomies, no cancer treatment for right. people. Uh, all of that is gone for 80% of our hospital beds, so that people need to be on the lookout for the Catholic Church buying up all our hospitals. Absolutely. The Catholic, the, the Catholic owned hospitals don't even give emergency contraception to somebody after they've been assaulted. It's, it's horrific, actually. Um, I am very close to a, a couple of abortion providers in Michigan, and I'm watching it really closely. I'm also just like in love with your governor. Um, and so I wish you the best. May Michigan be as Kansas was. Uh, hi, thanks for your uh, talk. I, hmm. I heard you mention, I've heard it before, that like the majority of even Texans support abortion rights. Mm -hmm. But the majority isn't that huge. I heard some statistic, it's like 45, 55, something like that. I would think it would be a much bigger majority, but it's not. So how do we reach those 45% that actually did support SB8, for instance, if that's the statistic I heard correctly? So my, the statistic I've heard most recently is 80% um, nationally, but in Texas it's more like 60% of people support abortion rights. It's lower than other parts of the country. Um, you could find the exact statistic probably if you go to Progress Texas or avow.org, which is the NARAL chapter here in Texas. Um, they'd probably give you the exact numbers. But um, the problem that I see with Texas is the percent of people that vote. It's about 28, 29% voter turnout um, usually here. And voter disenfranchisement and redistricting and blocking people from voting. Now there's like multiple layers of IDs that are required and they're throwing out mail-in ballots. I mean, that's what's happening in Texas is that you've got a majority of people who are in the minority who are in power who are ruling and they're trying to keep their power by voter disenfranchisement. Um, but if you talk to regular people, um, the majority of people do support access to safe abortion. Um, and I think that's a story that kind of needs to be retold. You know, I, I oftentimes remind people that nobody, nobody gets pregnant to have an abortion. It's not on anyone's bucket list. You know, it's not something, nobody wants to be our customer, right? Um, and so I think we have to remember that, um, that it's important for people to have access to safe abortion, but people don't take it lightly necessarily. And I think the way that abortion is portrayed um, oftentimes has a lot of shame and stigma, and it, it isn't necessarily something that people want to associate themselves with. And so I think telling people stories, talking about abortion in, in the affirmative, like I suggested, is one of the ways to kind of shift that narrative. But even in Texas, the numbers show that people are supportive but the people who are elected do not represent the majority of people in this state by any stretch. This is one of the states where there's a huge disparity between the people in power and the people who actually live here. Hi, thank you for being here. I live in Florida and we have a lot of waterways in Florida. And mm -hmm. I was wondering, is there a way to have like a women's clinic on a waterway? I remember like casino mm -hmm. boats used to be on waterways. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, we're at the Atlantic Ocean side, mm -hmm. well, in the Gulf. Can we mm -hmm. do a vessel? Yeah. Um, can we have women's clinic airways or airlines? Right. You know, anything. I'm just trying to think outside the box here. Yeah. No, I like I like your thinking. Um, many of us are th are doing things like that, like having a. Um, van, you know, like RV on the border. Um, there is a doctor from the University of California, San Francisco, who is fundraising right now for a ship, an abortion ship, um, to be in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and there's a uh, international physician, her name is Rebecca Gompartz, she's Dutch, and her organization is called Women on, the Wa Women on Waves. Um, and she um, has a ship that's outfitted with an uh, operating room in it, and she also does Women on the Web, so she mails people abortion pills in places where it's legal and where it's not legal. I think some of those um, actions are really needed at this point. Um, you have to be in international waters, not that I've done any research, but you, you have, like an oil platform would be really cool to build something on where you could have it in international waters so that you would, the ship could go back and forth but the clinic could be stable. Mm -hmm. uh, for those of us who are willing to take 
uh, women wherever, New Mexico, wherever. Mm -hmm. um, what, what are the criminal charges for us, and how safe were we there? So there is, there is nothing criminal about having an abortion in a state where it's legal, no matter where you're from. And I think all of you should be talking about that. Like, there's nothing illegal about a Texan we, going to Mexico. We can drive Mexico. them there. Mm -hmm. You can. Okay. You could also help them with gas cards so that they can drive themselves. Um, and I think um, there's that aiding and abetting has gotten more press. First of all, the criminal abortion ban from the, civil, from, from the Civil War era is now what's in effect in Texas. So that trumped, sorry to use the word Trump, but that, that like outdid SB8, right? So the aiding and abetting is a thing of the past. Now we actually have a criminal abortion ban where it's a felony, right, for a doctor or anybody to, to perform an abortion, uh, like a felony with a fine and jail time. That's the law we have now, right? So helping people get abortions in other places, there's nothing that you have to worry about about criminal. I, I would anticipate that's the kind of law that the anti-abortion folks are gonna try to be introducing, right? They're gonna try to restrict state, interstate travel. I think we have some allies um, to the aforementioned boat person. Um, I've been going to a lot of these border communities, right? The new borderlands of New Mexico, Southern Illinois, um, Bristol, Virginia, right? S places that are in the borders. And it's really interesting who else is there, right? The weed people, the gambling people, um, the liquor people, right, because some states have liquor laws that are different than other states, right, and so it's really interesting to see what people are crossing borders for and why, like state income tax, these people don't have a grocery tax, but these people do. Border communities are really interesting, and I think we're going to see more um, abortion providers, you know, having to go into those border communities, and it'll be interesting to see if we can have some, al un, you know, unanticipated allies with some of those other, um, other industries. That's it, we're all set. All right, good, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, I love this fashion.